and welcome back to Whiskey Politics. Dave Sussman here at Freedom Fest. I'm, de I'm delighted to be with Heather McDonald. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Dave. Heather is a fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor at City Journal and the author of The Diversity Delusion. So we're very excited. This is coming out? Coming out September 4th, September right after the 4th. Labor Day. Uh, tell us, what is The Diversity Delusion? Well, The Diversity Delusion is fundamentally the idea that America is profoundly racist and sexist. And we need to engineer racial and, and gender proportionality in order to overcome uh, this racism and sexism. This idea is taking over society at large. It comes out of the academy. Uh, you have now, universities have been completely colonized by a maudlin victimology that incessantly tells students that they are either the oppressed or the oppressors. Uh, the study of the humanities has been uh, trivialized and destroyed so students no longer are encouraged to come out of themselves and experience the greatest works of mankind. Instead, they're told to reject the greatest thinkers simply because they the, have the wrong gonads and melanin. It's a, it's a travesty as far as what university should be, but it is also threatening meritocracy in society at large. You say it comes out of the academies. Where does this come from? What is this genesis? Well, there was a moment in the 1970s where literary theory became very big and came up with a set of very bizarre ideas. In the 1980s, that those theories mutated into multiculturalism. Mm -hmm. And we had appalling incidents like at Stanford University with students led by Jesse Jackson shouting, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go. Again, the complaint against reading Plato, Shakespeare, Milton, Wordsworth, Aristotle is that they're white males and therefore are not worth uh, in engaging with and that they are actually oppressive. This is ludicrous. These students know nothing about great writing, great works, and great ideas, and yet they are being given the license by a spreading diversity bureaucracy on college campuses, by their professors, often by their presidents, uh, to reject knowledge to reject learning, to reject beauty in the name of their own narcissism and self-involvement. You talk about multiculturalism, and that is a value. We, we see that here in the United States. We also see that in Europe, and it's spreading uh, like topsy. What has been the impact on culture and society and business and corporations? It's very divisive because the it, it means that race and gender are trumping ideas. Nobody would object to naturally occurring diversity. You know, if a science lab happens to be all female or all Pakistani or all Hispanic, that's fabulous. As long as those people are hired based on their scientific acumen, what is happening instead, you have the federal government spending hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars pressuring science departments and universities, pressuring private scientific labs to hire by race and gender. If you're a white male scientist now, you're going to have to meet a much higher standard. Uh, you know, there was a lawsuit filed against YouTube and Google uh, by a human resources recruiter right. who refused to go along with their mandate to not even interview white male engineers, to only interview females and so-called persons of color, which is exclusively blacks and Hispanics. What this means is we are turning our backs on potentially groundbreaking scientists in the name of multiculturalism and diversity. And guess who doesn't care about these artificial measures of diversity? China. It remains committed in the sciences to ruthless meritocracy yeah. 
And if we continue going down this path, we're going to lose our competitive edge by placing irrelevant considerations ahead of scientific knowledge. We met at an American Freedom Alliance event a couple of weeks ago and you yes. spoke on this and you talked yes. about China. Talk about that in a little bit more detail because this is a significant and profound impact on not just what you're talking about, sociology, but global economics mm -hmm. and sciences as well, please. Well, yes, uh, this is unprecedented. The National Science Foundation has announced that you can only do good science if you have a diverse lab. And again, what they mean by that is not a diversity of scientific accomplishment. It means simply something as trivial as females and blacks and Hispanics. Uh, you cannot imagine the expenses that are spent by physics departments, chemistry departments, engineering departments, math departments to meet these diversity mandates to bring in uh, people to interview that the, the professors themselves know are not competitive. And yet, not just the National Science Foundation, but their own deans are saying, you have to uh, produce diversity. Science education is being slowed down and watered down. The uh, American Astronomy Association decided to get rid of the graduate record examination in physics, saying, well, astronomers should not be required to know physics. Why? Because females and so-called underrepresented minorities don't do as well on the GRE physics exam. This is placing, it's completely reversing what our priorities should be. And again, uh, you cannot continue down this path and expect that we will still be the leaders in scientific discovery and technological advancement. So what you're saying is that that will impact maybe possibly finding cures for diseases, of advancing technologies, and, and giving up our power to others that put a premium on intelligence over, and meritocracy, I would right. suggest, right. over diversity and multiculturalism. Yeah, the, the, the NSF says you can only be a good scientist if you're diverse. 200 former national science foundation grantees have gotten Nobel Prizes, they discovered dark matter, they discovered the genetics of viruses. Why? Because they were the best in their field. Today, they might not be advanced in their departments because they happen to be males uh, and a, a certain percentage of them are, are, are white. The Harvard Medical School dean recently removed all of the photos of their most prominent physician scientists from the entry hall of the Harvard Medical School because they were all male. And she thought that this was sending a negative message and that the Harvard medical students would somehow feel unsafe at Harvard seeing these scientists who happened to be male. As far as I'm concerned, the idea that as a female, I can only learn from other females is preposterous. If I want to be the best physicist, I want to learn from the best physicist, period. Uh, the this is ludicrous, and it's sexist, and it's also racist. These are the values that, and we're, we're talking mostly about the left here that's reporting this, that they've been fighting for for decades and all of a sudden, right. it's flipped on its head. That's absolutely right. Do they not see this? No, they don't. Uh, it's quite extraordinary, the doublespeak. Uh, the California voters had the wisdom in 1996 to pass a constitutional amendment, thanks to the great Ward Connerly, yeah. one of the former regents of the University of California. The, the con uh, state constitutional amendment said the government shall not make decisions based on race and gender. And this was immediately appealed to, uh, challenged in court by the NAACP, and they actually said that the only way that you can comply with the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which says that the, the, the government shall treat all groups equally in a colorblind manner, 
that the only way to comply with the 14th Amendment was to discriminate on the basis of race, to have racial preferences, that you, to be non-discriminatory you have to discriminate. It is a complete logical fallacy and it is also a social disaster because it is, it is increasing divisions. Right. You're bringing people into institutions who are not competitive. In the case of universities, uh, there's not a single selective college that doesn't employ massive racial preferences to bring in their so-called critical mass of blacks and Hispanics. This is not good for the beneficiaries of those preferences. And there's certain schools that are talking about increasing those racial preferences, uh, just yes. in reports. But to fight back, Betsy DeVos, Trump administration ed education, she's talking about removing the racial preferences that were implemented by the Obama administration. Is that something that you think would be a good start if it can, in fact, take place? Well, they, uh, in, in fact, the Justice Department and the Education Department recently did uh, withdraw a guidance that, several guidances, as a matter of fact, that the Obama administration said, saying, here, guys, here, universities, here's the way to use racial preferences. You know, these are the best way to do diversity. By removing the guidance, it still allows the universities to use preferences, alas. Right. Um, but the, the hysteria that this generated was just amazing. Uh, and what, what is also tragic about our racial discourse today is that the race advocates have decided that all they're going to demand is that universities lower their standards to admit less qualified blacks and Hispanics. The alternative would be to take the Booker T. Washington route and say, it's up to us to become competitive so we don't need racial preferences. Let's crack the books, let's imitate the Asians who are absolutely fanatical about academic achievement. Uh, let's have families monitoring their students' in involvement in school, their attendance in classes, taking their homework. And that is something that is never said. Instead, there's this discourse of complaint saying, well, if we're not being admitted in proportional numbers, the fault is the institution, you should lower your standards. So, yes, the, the Trump administration should be scouring the regulatory code to remove all mandates for proportionality. The, there's a concept out there called disparate impact, which is highly destructive. It should be getting rid of that. Uh, so I think there's a, a, a good realm of government action here, but I think people also have to stand up themselves mm -hmm. and say that the premise of this whole diversity crusade, which is that the United States remains a profoundly oppressive place, is simply fiction. You know, you're referring to, I think it's chicken and egg here, because academia seems to be following culture, and culture, especially the breakdown of the family in the mm -hmm. inner cities, and. And that has an impact on obviously education as well. Um, if, if you're talking about this, and a lot of people will come out and say, oh, you're racist, you're sexist, you're homophobic, you're intolerant. Sure. Yet there is a rise of intolerance on this other side here. Can you uh, 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 answer to, to, to the question of how is this rise of intolerance happening when it seems that they have been uh, pushing to be so tolerant for so long? Yeah. Well, it's like a dichotomy. Please there. explain to me how the the thugs that are breaking windows, assaulting Trump supporters, get away with being called antifa, the anti-fascists. Mm -hmm. They are engaging in very worrisome behavior that has a lot of historical echoes uh, with the rise of very violent fascism in Germany. They get away with it because obviously the media is committed to this discourse of endemic, perpetual uh, racism. And you have a whole set of assaults now on the concept of free speech that if something gets characterized as hate speech, therefore it's so injurious to the very existence of, of um, 
females and minorities that it is rightly censored. Let's be clear what the media establishment, what the left calls hate speech, is a very far from what most people would consider hate speech. I was, for instance, uh, protested very violently at Claremont McKenna College in huge California. Yes. There was a blockade. Uh, nobody could attend the talk. They surrounded the building. I had to be escorted in under police escort, escorted out under police escort. But the language that was used against me was just at a level of, of shrillness. You know, I'm homophobic, transphobic, you know, racist, misogynist. Why? Because I had written a book called The War on Cops that argued that the Black Lives Matter narrative that we're living through an epidemic of racially biased police shootings was not borne out by the facts. Right. And my book is data filled. And it's also filled with voices of residents of high crime minority neighborhoods who fervently support the police. This was serious reporting. Nevertheless, it gets deemed as hate speech and something that should not be even in the, in the remote proximity of undergraduate students because it would threaten their very existence. Um, I was born and raised in England. Uh, go back to England You lost today. your accent. I know, I've been here for, for over 40 years now. But the, uh, you go back to England today, especially in some of the suburbs outside of London, and the demographics have changed significantly. Yeah. You go to Paris, the demographics have changed significantly. Italy, Germany, all throughout Western Europe. This drive, this zeal towards multiculturalism. It is having a political impact. We see that with possibly Brexit. Yeah. There's, there's, there's big pushes right now in Western Europe to do uh, follow uh, likewise. Um, how is this impacting society and education and business as we know it today? Uh, Western Europe uh, very much following what the United States is doing too. This is a very profound moment of people across the West rising up in rebellion against the elites who have basically said there shall be open borders and there should be endless migration of people legally and mostly illegally from the third world uh, and that the publics have no right to say we are going to determine the character of our own societies. Uh, there is a, a limit to how any society can assimilate people from radically different cultures. Uh, you know, it's fine to have a certain degree of immigration, but when you have a virtual stampede, uh, it becomes impossible. And we're seeing that with the segregation in outside of European cities. Uh, here you have a, a real transformation of California uh, by unchecked illegal immigration. And without the ability to assimilate, what we're seeing instead is assimilation into underclass culture. In California, which is really the harbinger of the U United States' as a demographic future, because you have now... Uh, what starts in California moves east. Yeah, and, and yeah. you know, you have now 50, over well over a majority of all students are... Hispanic, um, and birth, births are simply overwhelmingly Hispanic. Again, we've lost the ability to assimilate. Uh, it's a different culture without the same emphasis on education. In the 50s, California led the country in educational attainment. There was nothing to beat our schools and universities and our schools. Now, if you look at California's test scores on reading, on math in elementary K through 12, they are at the rock bottom of the country on the same level of backwaters like Mississippi and Alabama. Um, so culture matters and the, any country has a right to choose people who have the cultural outlook of academic involvement, high skills, language, that will advance themselves. And the elites have said, sorry, you don't get that choice. Uh, and, and I think 
again, it's not xenophobic, it's not racist. If, if there was a, a large influx of white Europeans into Africa, yeah. you better believe there'd be objections. Heather, you're an intellectual. You talk about the elites. Silicon Valley arguably controls much of our culture now, more so than up the west side of New York City through the media. Sure. Okay? These people aren't dumb. I know many of them. They're highly educated. But it's almost as if there's a zeal towards an ideology that doesn't make sense to us. Don't they see it? How can they be blind to it? I don't know. Part of it is, I mean, one of the most infuriating things in the recent immigration debates is the people like the Silicon elites that will say, we don't want any reconsideration of our immigration policy, will point to Sergey Brin, you know, Google. As as the right as the epitome of immigration. Therefore, if we change our immigration policy, we'll lose our Sergey Brins. That is Sergey Brin was, was a legal immigrant. He was predictable. His parents were Russian mathematicians. Okay. It was predictable that he would go on to found one of the most important com companies on the planet. Uh, that he would change how we think about technology. Sergey Brin's, Brin's parents are very different from the illiterate, according to an NPR show I heard recently, single mothers who are now coming across the southern border with their children demanding asylum. It's a completely different culture. And so what, what's going on with the Silicon Valley elites? I don't know. As you say, it cannot be explained necessarily by self-interest. It, it, ideology, ideas matter. And I think they've come out of the university environment. They have marinated for eight years in the poisonous academic ideology of victimhood. Yeah. And they believe it. And they want to score virtue points. We saw this again with the firing of computer engineer James Damore. We both met a couple weeks ago. At the American Freedom Alliance. Yes. Because he had written a completely fact-based, reasonable, non-hysterical memo suggesting that something other than sexism may explain why Google and other tech companies don't have 50-50 male-female gender parity. He said, on average, males and females have different types of career preferences. Males, on the one hand, being more inclined towards highly abstract, ideas-based realms. Females, on average, again, right. speaking on averages, not individual cases, more oriented towards human, people-based skills. Damore was fired for writing this memo, and the language that the CEO of Google used in firing him was a direct import from academic victimology. He said Google's employees were hurting because of this memo. So it is now, what's going on in the academy and what I describe in the book yeah. is now in the DNA of our elite tech sector. And you refer to, and also in the book, I understand the erosion of humanities as well? Yes, it's, uh, it's a tragedy. Again, I was fortunate enough to be in school in the college in the 1970s before multiculturalism had, had hit at all in the 1980s. And even though I was in an environment of very odd and arcane literary theory that would, as I say, go on to spawn multiculturalism in certain ironic ways, nobody thought to say, I can't read Milton's description lush, fecund, extraordinarily sensual description of paradise in Paradise Lost because Milton is a male. Nobody thought to say, I can't be overwhelmed by the terrifying choruses of Aeschylus's Oresteia that speak to human forces that are more profound than most of us can understand. Nobody thought to say, I can't fully engage with that because Aeschylus was male. Instead, I was allowed to plunge headlong into beauty, 
into some of the most complex language, most insightful language that has ever been created because it was the best, not because it mirrored my so-called gender. And I'm very grateful for that. And it, it, it's a tragedy that students in college and, and in high schools today are not given that freedom. Instead, the first thing that they hear is check off the boxes of whether this author meets your own pathetically narrow identity, and if he doesn't, you're licensed to reject him. This is scary, and water finds its own level. That's just science, and what you're saying is that by preventing us from learning and students from learning the traditions and the and, and, and humanities, uh, it will be filled in by somebody else. You'll have science uh, advanced by China or India, whoever it is, that they don't put uh, obviously a value on these same things. And it is scary, and it's, it's, it's something that makes me somewhat less optimistic for the future. Give me something to be optimistic for. What do you, what do you see as far as does this turn around? Does the pendulum swing back? What do you think happens here? Well, uh, you know, there are, there's a whole series of, of classical academies that are being created now with the help of Hillsdale College for K through 12 right. for students and their parents who have the wisdom to say, no, I want my child to be exposed to the humanistic tradition without the poison of identity politics. Uh, in, you know, there's a, a, a test, a market test. I write in the book about uh, a, a company called The Great Courses. Yes, it used to be called fantastic. The Teaching Company. And they provide uh, courses that people can buy on DVD in the classics. And they've made just millions of dollars off of this because there's a hunger among adults for what they missed in college. And, uh, you know, and English, depart English majors that re remain traditional, there are very few of them left, were wildly oversubscribed. Students actually want to lose themselves in beauty. Uh, how, we, how we break the lock of the university, it's a very tough question because they have a lock on credentializing children. Uh, you know, and so somehow we have to figure out a way to create an alternative institution that will confer the same prestige as going to these selective colleges that have sadly now betrayed their primary mission. Yeah, yeah. I, I think an, an alternative media, alternative education, there is an intellectual, we call it the intellectual dark web, right. online, we're having conversations like this. Uh, this is this is a new industry. It's burgeoning right now, and it's and and more and more people are, are are coming to it. They're they're discovering this and the content of Jordan Peterson's online yeah. and all of the podcasts and, and the interviews that we see. I'm positive because of that because we're stepping outside of it, whether mm -hmm. it's Sam Harris or whoever it may be. Right. And I think that's very very positive. Um, and I think. Folks like yourself and writing, uh, you know, books like *The Diversity Delusion*. It's available September. September fourth. September the fourth. But so it can we'll be pre-ordered now. We we'll put the pre-order up for Amazon.com, okay. wherever it may be. And uh, I just want to say thank you for what you do. You're thank speaking you, out. It's brave. Uh, I know you take a lot of incoming. And, you know, listen, Claremont wasn't easy for you. Yeah, I'm. I'm just sick of the idiocy. I really am. You know, I don't yeah. care about the name calling. I. I can't stand people uh, betraying facts. It just drives me crazy. Yeah, yeah. And I also can't stand them destroying our, our culture. I, you, you know, there are definitely utilitarian problems and, and con utilitarian consequences for our destruction of the humanities. But the other reason that they should be preserved and we should be down on our knees in gratitude towards them is simply they're an end in themselves. And if we stop reading these great books, they die. Uh, right, we've got the dark web, but we have an obligation to keep them alive. They are an end in themselves. Reading and, and, and absorbing works of beauty is an end in itself, and it makes everyone's life fuller, and you attain a, a level of 
experience and understanding that is otherwise not available. I appreciate that. Real quick last question for you. I do appreciate your time, Heather. When you take incoming, whether it's on Twitter or social media or at a, a college where people are screaming at you, you're a nice person. <laughs> you're a good person. Yeah. You're an intellectual. You like to write. You like to discuss things. You're not evil. You don't have an evil bone in your body. How do you deal with that? How do you cope with it? It's wearying, I have to say. Uh, you know, I think there's some really happy warriors out there like Ann Coulter, David Horowitz, that yeah. relish being called racist, you know. Right. To me, I, I don't relish it so much. You know, it's, I, I, I do get kind of exhausted. And with regards to the cops issue, you know, I'm, I'm periodically tempted to just say to hell with this, you know, if, if a certain amount of voices, and again, the Black Lives Matter movement is not, does not have unanimous support in inner city communities. But if, if the main leaders want to get rid of the police, which results inevitably in much higher crime, so be it, yeah. you know. Yeah. I, I don't know, but then, but then I talk to people like law-abiding residents of these communities that say, please, we need protection protection, and I say, I've got to get back into the fray. Good for you. Please don't leave. <laughs> we need you. We need voices well, you. like you, and keep writing. Looking forward uh, for everybody to be able to buy the Diversity Delusion coming up September the 4th. Where can folks find you? Twitter, on Facebook? Where, uh, do you have a certain... Well, there's a Twitter account that is yeah. actually run by the Manhattan Institute that sends out my writings. Right. Uh, and the Manhattan Hype dash institute.org has my writings in city journals. Excellent. So. Heather McDonald, thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Dave. Great conversation. Right, we'll be soon. And uh, folks, you can continue to follow us at whiskeypolitics.net. Follow our YouTube series on YouTube, America's Voice Network Television, and ricochet.com, as well as all your favorite podcast applications. And uh, we'll be back again very soon. And again, special thanks to Heather McDonald. Thank, thank you, thank Dave. You. So I'm delighted to have with us the host of the Fox show uh, Justice with Judge Janine and the author of the new book, Liars, Leakers and Liberals, The Case Against the Anti-Trump Conspiracy, Judge Janine Pirro. Welcome, Judge. Uh, how are you? Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much. And by the way, uh, before we get started here real quickly, I met with Brandon Strzok last night and he says hi and that he loves oh. you. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. Thank you. I'm a big fan of his, too, as I'm sure you know. And uh, I definitely uh, I definitely need to have him on justice again. You know, it's fascinating how America is changing before our very eyes that, you know, people are now getting sick and tired of all of the lunacy going on. And that's why I wrote the book, Liars, Leakers and Liberals. You know, it's a factual analysis of what's going on. And then when you get a liberal, uh, someone like Brendan, who just says, look, even I'm tired of it, I say to myself, well, maybe I'm on the right side of this. Yeah, I mean, you see this happening right now with the particular discourse that we're seeing. You saw it last week, and I don't want to talk about the show, the view, the whoopee. I just don't want to give her the time. Oh, but yeah. what, what, are, what are we seeing right now with, with our civil discussion with each other? You know, what's amazing is they accuse, the left accuses Donald Trump of being a fascist. And if you support him, you're a fascist. And I must tell you that fascism is when you only tolerate one way of thinking. And if you go outside of that way of thinking, then you're a, a, a fascist. But right now, it's the left calling the right fascism when they're the ones who will only tolerate one way of thinking. And that's why I wrote Liars, Leakers, and Liberals. Look, we have, from the beginning of this country, from the founding of this country, had a free speech and the ability to have civil discourse. But the left, whenever there is a Republican president that, you know, they can't stand, and they did a lot of this to Ronald Reagan, uh, they have a hissy fit. You know, George Bush gets elected. We have to go to the Supreme Court to make sure it's right. Um, this kind of thing is typical of the left, and it is over the top. So when you reference the view, I went on the view because I felt that, you know, we could have a discussion. They weren't interested in, in a discussion. I mean, you can go to YouTube and check it out. 
Uh, and, and the second segment, there was only supposed to be one, just the wheels fell off the wagon and I was thrown out of the building. And, you know, in the end, everything in my book, Liars and Leakers, is factual. I've been a prosecutor, judge, and DA for over three decades. I've run for office five times. I get it. And I know a con when I see it. And what the left is doing and what, unfortunately, the upper echelon of the FBI, the Department of Justice, CIA, DNI, um, you know, this, this kind of stuff is, is unheard of. Yeah, it's a yeah. It's country of law and order, and it's just wrong. Yeah. I, I know I know you you're you're short for time here. I've got a couple of questions from Ricochet members for you. There's uh one uh Ricochet member, her name is Front Seat Cat. She says, first of all, she's a big fan. She says, Judge, is everything that is going on in the Mueller investigation legal and when will it end? Well, that's a great question. Uh there are those people who will say that, you know, the Mueller investigation uh having been expanded by Rod Rosenstein, who's the one who convinced uh, Jeff Sessions, the attorney general, to go hide in the closet somewhere. Um, Rod Rosenstein, think about this. He wrote the memo for the president that saying Jim Comey should be fired. Once the president fires Jim Comey, Rod Rosenstein assigns someone to find out if the president should have uh, fired Jim Comey, and he appoints his friend Bob Mueller. Bob Mueller, Jim Comey. Rod Rosenstein, they're all from the same clique. So to answer the question directly, they have the power to uh, uh, appoint a special prosecutor. But they convinced, they convinced Sessions to get out of the way, and then what they did was they expanded his powers, uh, this guy Mueller, and now we're talking about hookers and porn stars. We don't need to be fractured like this. And they keep promising Russia collusion, and we haven't seen any of it. Every day they were running to the cameras, we've got collusion. Well, you know that saying, you point one finger, the other three fingers point back at you. In the end, the only collusion was Hillary Clinton, who was selling our, our uranium that would have $145 million payback to her so-called charity. And, you know, Barack Obama saying, hey, tell Vlad I'll have more flexibility after the election. This is bad stuff, and we've got to make sure that we, that we just continue to support the president and continue to fight for law and order. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another another question here, which follows up on what you're just talking about, which I think is in your book, and that's from Judge Mental and Simon Templer, again, two individuals at, at Ricochet. Do you have any faith left that the guilty parties in the IRS, DOJ, and FBI will be held responsible for their actions? Absolutely not. Uh, and I hate to say that because, you know, Lady Justice has been the person that, you know, I've followed my whole career. Uh, Jeff Sessions came out and, and said, we're not going to, we're not going to prosecute Lois Lerner. And I want to ask the, uh, your listeners uh, if, if they know who is the person who gave the 501c tax exempt status to the Clinton Global Initiative in 2009. If you want to make a guess, you're probably right. It was Lois Lerner. Lois Lerner has her fingerprints over everything anti uh, uh, conservative and uh, you know a corruption within the uh, IRS, and it pains me to say because I devoted my whole life to a level playing field, fighting for the underdog. And when these people are getting away with it, because we've got Jeff Sessions who just doesn't want to do his job and has been convinced he should, for whatever reason, and I don't know, then Americans lose faith in this system of justice, and that breaks my heart. Mm-hmm. Okay. Fantastic. Well, I, I, I think that perspective is shared by a lot of people, and it's really concerning. And if you go back to that administration, you see folks like um, Eric Holder, right? He sounds like he's considering dipping his toe into the 2020 presidential race. The man became the first and only cabinet member to ever be held in contempt by Congress. I think it was Fast and Furious, I believe. What are your thoughts on somebody That's like right. him running here? Well, you know, but doesn't that just, isn't that just the icing on the cake that the one guy held in contempt of Congress for his role in sending uh, a, a, a weapon to the Mexican cartel without even following or tracking the weapons, which weapons are then used to kill one of our border agents and countless others in Mexico, uh, that this guy wants to be the commander in chief. It's frightening and it should frighten every American. Look, you know, when 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 Eric Holder, you know, uh, tells Lois Lerner, come talk to me, 
and she goes and talks to him, the prosecutor, but she won't talk to Congress. She'll claim the Fifth Amendment. What does that tell you? That tells you she's not worried about the prosecutor. He's got her back, but she's worried about uh, the American people in Congress. So you know, all of it is, is shameful, and that's why I wrote Liars, Leakers, and Liberals. I, I talk about all of these characters, Eric Holder, Lois Lerner, you know, and the background of all of them, John Brennan, Jim Clapper. And I talk about my friend Donald Trump, who I've known for almost 30 years, and all the good stuff that he's doing for Americans that the mainstream media just doesn't want to talk about. Let's, let's talk about that real quickly here. Media Matters which obviously is a virulent enemy against this president and conservatism, they, quote-unquote, said, Fox News' Janine Pirro sold out her public image and debased herself to become one of President Trump's go-to pundits. How do you answer a, a leftist group like this in regards of your support for this president? Well, look, I, I mean, that doesn't bother me. Uh, they can say whatever they want about me. I, I've had a stellar career. I've been the prosecutor, judge, and DA. I started the first domestic violence unit in the nation for battered women. I have fought for um, equal justice for the silent victims of crime. I won an Emmy in my last court show. Uh, right now, my book is on the bestsellers list. Um, and, you know, my show, Justice, is number one uh, pretty much every weekend on Fox News. And, you know, they can say what they want, but I know Donald Trump, the man. They don't. I know that not one metric has suffered under Donald Trump. And, in fact, everyone is better off. I know Donald Trump is the tip of the spear. It was framed with a Russia collusion investigation by people who now want to call everyone else, you know, uh, whatever they want to call them. I don't care what the left calls me or anyone else. I believe in lady justice and I believe in this country and the First Amendment. And think about it. The people who want to shut down the First Amendment and anyone on the right are the people on the left. The George Soros socialist anti spa a uh, group that wants to do whatever it can to destroy capitalism. Well, you know what? Capitalism is what makes America great. Small businesses now have tax cuts and, and deregulation so we can provide for our families. I don't care what they say about me with all due respect uh, because I know who I am and I know what I stand for and I believe in the truth. And that's why my book, every fact in that book is, is footnoted. Yeah. And it's an easy read, but it's all supported by footnotes. Yeah, yeah. And as you said, it's on the number one list, not just in the New York Times, but the Washington uh, Washington Post, I believe. Yeah, Washington Post also. Congratulations and, on that. Now, you're, you're a supporter you. of this president. Is there something about his policies or maybe his personality? I know you've known him for many years, but is there something you'd want him to change? You know, um, I'd like him to get more sleep, to be honest with you. The man never sleeps. And I know this because my then-husband was his lawyer. Uh, when I knew him, uh, we used to uh, fly down to Florida with him on the weekends. And our kid, when our kids were young, I mean, this man just worked constantly. And he gets up every day to incoming. Um, I, you know, anyone who is starting a movement or is fighting for the American people against this swamp and this establishment, and some of this establishment are the rhinos where one hand washes another. Um, you know, I just want him to take care of himself, and I want him to continue to fight for us. I wouldn't change a darn thing about the guy. I really wouldn't. Sometimes I think he would actually, i, I got to change that. Sometimes I wish he wouldn't tweet so much. But you know what? That's his business. The tweeting. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I think, I mean, I know you've been a supporter for him, uh, of him for a long time, and there was a lot of people that were extremely skeptical of him. Uh, now you've got 19 months of history and the, uh, the successes that have been implemented. I think there's a lot of people that are surprised. Uh, are you hearing that? Yeah, I'm hearing that a lot by a lot of people who, by the way, don't want to give him credit but are happy that they've got more money in their paycheck. They're happy, you know, that they don't have to worry about the ISIS caliphate that, you know, Obama couldn't figure out whether it's to contain, dismantle, or destroy, none of which he did. I think Americans are happy that, um, you know, the economy is doing well and that, you know, right now, yet denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula is on the table. And by the way, when this president met with Putin, he did what every leader has done for the last 75 years, every president has done. 
but they just hate him so much. They don't care that he's a success. They don't want to talk about his successes. They just want to badmouth him, and they want to stop people on the right like me from saying what we think or buying my book or throwing me out of a building. And you know what? The good, hardworking Americans of this country know what's going on, and that's why they instinctively elected Donald Trump. They knew something was awry. They knew. People go to Washington with mediocre means and come out with boatloads of money for them or their family. It's all not good. Let's clean it up, and it's not going to be easy. But this man who's a billionaire who should probably be on a golf course somewhere made a decision to make America great again. And, you know, we've got to thank him for that and support him. And I do, and I will. Liars, Leakers, and Liberals, The Case Against Anti-Trump Conspiracy. Judge Janine Pirro, you can find her on Fox News. And uh, do you have any social media you'd like to point people to? Yeah, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at Judge Janine. Instagram is Judge underscore Janine. But go at Judge Janine. Uh, and uh, I just want to thank you and thank your listeners for having me on. I very much appreciate it, the opportunity to at the very least say what I think. Well, soothe that throat. We need you and uh, you're a strong voice and appreciate everything that you bring as far as energy for uh, conservatism. Thank you so much, Judge Janine Pirro, and get get yourself better. Thank you. I will. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. And folks, thank you for listening. We greatly appreciate it. It's your listenership that is helping us bring these great guests to you, whether it's on audio or on video. And if you're watching on video, please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit subscribe and uh, interact with some of the other folks that are commenting on there. The boards are getting quite interesting on YouTube. And you can also find us at America's Voice News Network. It's a new network. It's uh, about to be on Dish. I believe it's also about to be on Comcast and DirecTV. And looking forward to it to be on Roku and Apple TV for those of us who've cut the cord and uh, we have our own show on there and there's a lot of other fascinating folks on there as well so uh, hopefully you'll you'll check that out and if you're just listening on your podcast application of choice whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play please make sure you give us a five-star rating especially in iTunes as it definitely helps and of course you can find us at the Ricochet Audio Network again very special thanks to Heather McDonald and Judge Janine Pirro and we'll be back again very soon I'm Dave Sussman with Whiskey Politics.